Well, I'm glad we talked about the lighthouse because the reality is this. This morning, we're going to be starting a series called Ready, Set, Go and dealing with the issue of evangelism. And evangelism is just the way in which we share the good news. And the good news of the gospel is this. Jesus died on a cross for your sins so that you could no longer be alienated from God but be saved through him. Instead of being in a place where you felt like there was chaos, God comes to bring you peace through him, through his work of salvation, through his son, Jesus Christ. So we're going to be talking about evangelism in the next three weeks. Ready, set, go. And today we're going to talk about being ready. In this day and age, we're always being reminded to be ready, be prepared. Um, the Boy Scout slogan, right? Be prepared. Uh, we might want to be prepared uh, when we go hiking on the outdoors and say, have we put everything in our pre pre preparation kit? Do we have? Oh, sorry. You're right, Caleb. It's three fingers. Boy Scouts. Thank you, Caleb. Three fingers. I'm so used to Cub Scouts. It's two fingers. Three fingers for Boy Scouts. Thank you. Next week is Boy Scout Sunday. So, um, Boy Scouts, be prepared. And um, you, you never know what you're going to experience when you go in the backwoods. You might need to make sure you have that first aid kit because you never know what might happen. Um, you know, making sure you're prepared. Uh, we look to be prepared for things like hurricanes. You're thinking to yourself, hurricanes? I grew up in Florida. We had hurricanes. So we'd have hurricane preparedness. Winter storms here in the, in the Midwest. Earthquakes. But... Be prepared for the weather and natural disasters. We go to places like ready.gov, right? We go to websites to help us know what we need to have for those different events. Because we know that bad things might happen or that our normal way of existence could be disrupted, we choose to do whatever it takes to survive, right? But we're hoping that we're going to be prepared for whatever that survival situation is. We, we want to be prepared. You know, I, I, I come prepared most days. I'm, I'm carrying at least my pocket knife. I don't know that I'm ever going to need it for something, but I just want to say I'm prepared. Right? Survival um, does not ha always happen by accident, but more importantly, by design. We survive because we have prepared to survive. We prepare for events. We survive events because we planned for the worst and hoped for the best. We plan for the worst and hope for the best, right? I remember last year, uh, this time of uh, last year, we had those really bad winter storms, and, and we were expecting to have power outages, and, and we weren't sure what that was going to mean. In fact, the city came to hear the church and said, we want to make sure your facility is ready just in the event of an emergency. Uh, we're uh, we're uh, the third level of shelter here for the Winchester area. Um, the first place being the Catholic Church, second place being the Armory, and we're number three on the list. So if we lose power in this community, our gym is a place in which we would have people come and, and find a place of shelter. So we need to be prepared. But preparation in a spiritual life is important just as much as it is in our physical existence. We need to be prepared when it comes to sharing the gospel. The gospel, the word gospel means this, good news. So anytime you ever hear the word gospel, it should be understood as good news. And I can tell you this much. If you don't hear good news when you hear the story about Jesus and what he wants to do for you, then they're not telling you the truth. Because the story of Jesus and the, word, and, and the story of the gospel is always good news. But I can tell you this much. If we are not prepared to share the story of Jesus in a way that is good news, it might sound to others as bad news. Now, I don't want our story, our sharing of the gospel to sound like bad news. I want to make sure that I share the good news. Amen? So we, but we have to do that by design. It's intentional that we do these things. So today we begin our series, Ready, Set, Go. And we'll be discussing the processes by which we can most effectively share the gospel or the good news of Jesus with others. My guess is that this preparation will not require duct tape. So I want us to turn to our Bibles this morning in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, it'll be up on the screen behind me. I'm just going to give you two little small verses of, of Scripture this morning. It says this, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. 
Always be prepared, be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give you the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. There's a couple of things that we can point out just in the scripture this morning. Be prepared for the answer that we have because we have hope. But do that with gentleness and respect. In other words, when we share the good news, it needs to come across as good news. And the best way we can do that is by making sure we are ready to share that, that gospel message with one another in a way that calls or draws people to Jesus Christ rather than to push them away. I can tell you this much. Every single person you encounter is going to be different. Every single person we encounter with, when we share the gospel message of Jesus Christ is going to respond to you or the message differently. Don't take that personally. It just means that they may be at a different place than you, than you were hoping they might be. Be patient with them. I can tell you there's an individual I, I quite frequently share the, the message of Jesus and, and use an invitational style with. Uh, and uh, the person says, you never give up, do you? And the answer is no, I don't. I just keep trying. I keep trying a different, a different angle, a different technique. But they know that I do it with gentleness and respect. That's what, the, God, that's what the scripture asks us to do, isn't it? With gentleness and respect. So I want to kind of walk you through a uh, little, little scenario this morning and kind of help us unpack evangelism made easier. Sometimes we hear the word evangelism and we get scared, don't we? You want me to do what? Uh, that's for the pastor to do. Evangelism, that's the pastor's job, right? It is the pastor's job. But it's also our job. Uh, and I need you to partner with me uh, because we, it's all, what we are all called to do. Jesus says it to his disciples, go as you're going, make disciples. As you're going, make disciples. Share the good news. So I want us to point us, point us to a couple things, and, and you can remember this through a, a little acronym, RSS. Okay? RSS. So the first one is R, Revelation. We talked about Revelation. Jesus came into our world to reveal himself to you and to me. Jesus came into our world to reveal himself to you and to me. Now we think about that revelation. Oh, that sounds like ominous, you know. We, we see him in, in, in the way that he reveals himself self in the world. We see it through nature, right? We see things like that. But I want to be more specific of how God reveals himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Yes, we have Jesus who comes into our world as a little baby, and we think about Jesus at Christmas time, and we think about him and the glory of the, the Lord shall be revealed, and we think about that little baby, right? Maybe that's the way we think about Revelation. But I want to get more specific. How does God reveal himself to you? Because he does it all the time. You heard Mandy Gagenheimer just a few minutes ago say, you know, I wasn't sure that God was there every single moment of the time as I walked through it. But I can tell you he was there every time he was revealing himself to me. He was showing himself to me. And I want to praise him. So Revelation that I'm talking about is very specific. It's what God... It's what God wants to reveal to you and to me, very specifically. So some questions that we might ask ourselves when it comes to dealing with this issue of revelation is this one. How do you know that Jesus is real? How do you know that Jesus is real? We can't tell somebody else that Jesus is real if we don't know that Jesus is real. You can't tell somebody else Jesus is real if you don't know that Jesus is real yourself. But I can tell you this much. Jesus wants to reveal himself to you and to me very personally. He doesn't just want to be a God who lives in a lofty place. He wants to be a God who is, wants to reside in your heart, who wants to show himself that he is real in every facet of your life, every single minute of every single day. Sometimes we don't always see him. Why? Because we are not looking for him. Sometimes he's speaking to us and he's revealing himself to us and we're too busy with life. But when we can take that moment of pause, we, we can recognize that he has been there 
every step of the way. So the question that I'm going to ask you when it comes to this issue of preparing yourself for sharing the gospel is answering this question. How do you know that Jesus is real? Because if you don't know the answer to that question, when you get asked that question by somebody else who doesn't know Jesus, they're going to say, how do you know Jesus is real? Do you have an answer? If you've prepared to answer that question, if you already know the answer to it, you are ready. Amen? So we have a, so think about what that means to you. How do you know that Jesus is real? The second question is this. Who is Jesus to you? I know it seems very similar, but who is Jesus to you? Sometimes we say, Jesus is my healer. Maybe our story has where Jesus came and healed us. Maybe Jesus is my deliverer. I used to be addicted to drugs and, and uh, painkillers, and, and I had an alcohol addiction. Whatever, whatever God took us out of it, he is my deliverer. Um, he is my peace. Maybe you're going through a very difficult time, and, and Jesus became your peace. So think about who Jesus is to you. What kind of, if you were to give Jesus a face, what kind of face is Jesus to you? Because I think we could have Jesus have many faces. Even in our own lives, I think some of us would say, you know, this particular time Jesus was this, and this particular time Jesus was this. So who is Jesus to you? But then to keep, it, to keep making sure that it is fresh and real and, and right on target with where you are today is to focus a little further in asking ourselves this question, which is, who is Jesus or how has Jesus revealed himself to you in the last two weeks? How has God been real in your life in the last two weeks? Okay, so the, the, uh, the goal of this or the concept behind this is how has God shown himself to you in the last couple of weeks? In other words, it's not that God happened, you know, in 1947. God showed up in my life. So how can we make that real? How can that... How can that be something that we can say, this is how God is showing himself to me in the last two weeks? In other words, it's a, it's a real up-to-date kind of experience. So revelation. Who is Jesus to you? How do you understand Jesus? How is he revealing himself to you in a real-time experience? Okay, revelation. Second thing is this, salvation. Salvation. One of the things that we need to do is, is being able to share the, the story of what it was like before Christ... And what our life is after Christ. So a BC experience versus an AC experience. Before Christ, after Christ. Now maybe you're here today and you would say, I have not experienced salvation. Or maybe I did a long time ago, but it's kind of, I'm not really sure it's happening today. I've got great news. I've got great news for you today. Jesus says, come unto me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. He's here wanting you to experience his salvation. So you can experience the before of Christ and after Christ today. You can stand right there and say, today I experienced a salvation where God took my old way and made it new again. We see it through scripture. And sometimes scripture is helpful. And sometimes scripture doesn't always help people. Sometimes scripture helps us, right? As Christians, we, we, we're okay with that, that language. But sometimes that language does not always translate. For instance, 2, P, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Now, we, we understand that in a, in a churchy way. But how do we explain that to somebody who's maybe on the outside looking in? Well, break it down so it sounds so you explain the concept, keeping in line with Scripture, but in a way that they're going to understand it. Say, you know what? When Christ comes into your life, the things that you that you used to be pulled into, he helps you stop going those directions. He starts taking a new direction. So old old direction doesn't always work out for you. He wants to take a new direction, a place where he can make you a new person and change your life in a positive way. So there's ways in which we repackage scripture to make it useful and accessible to those around us. So one, of, one, a couple more questions we might ask ourselves to kind of help prepare us in explaining how Jesus changed us is to ask ourselves this question. 
How has Christ changed you, right? How has Christ changed you? For some of you, you have a story that says, you know what, I used to be, well, I can make sailors blush. I had a dirty mouth. Or I used to be this way, or I used to be that way. Okay? And some of you are in the process of being transformed. I know there are people who have just come to faith recently, and they're saying, you know what, I know God wants to change how I speak and how I address people and deal with my issue of anger or you know, whatever those issues that we all experience. But when we can point to say, you know what, I am a different person, it explains to people that Christ has changed you. And if they really know you and they've been around you, they might not, you might not have to say a word about the change that God has made. Because they see it in you each and every day. So the question is, how has Christ changed you? Think about how you might ask, answer that question if somebody says, well, how did Christ change you? How are you different? Why should I be a Christian? Why should I be a Christian? So not only how has Christ changed you, past tense, but how is Christ changing you in the present? Because I think all of us need to be having a present experience. Well, God's teaching me that, you know, I need to be kinder to people. Or, you know, I, I thought I was doing okay over in this area. And, you know, my faith is being, being tested. You know, I, this is this in my life. You know, what, you know, when you hear people say, you know, I just, for instance, I just got a, a diagnosed with cancer. Well, how is God revealing yourself or changing you in the middle of something like that? You've got a great opportunity to share what God is doing in the midst of, of, of the storm. How do you share what God is doing in the midst of, of life's struggles and battles? People want to know that there's a real God who deals with real people. And you're, we're real people. But we also had a real God who wants to reveal himself, not only to the world, but to you, so that you can share how God is revealing himself to you, to the world. So there's the revelation of God, the salvation of God, and the other S is this, story. Story. What's your story? How did you come to faith in Jesus Christ? Oh, it's missing. Oh, it's missing. Okay, story. It's missing on the slide. Story. What's your story? How did you come to faith in Jesus Christ? How did you come to faith in Jesus Christ? How are you different? And then you know what? People are going to ask this question. Could God, could God change me? Could God change me? I want you to know that God can change the vilest offender. There are story upon story of how God has changed people who you thought there's no way that God could ever change that person. Don't tell God that he can't because there's nothing that's impossible with him. Nothing that's impossible. We need to be able to tell our story. Our story of faith is a key component. Why did you decide to follow Christ? What, what was the, the thing that said, you know what, today is the day you choose to follow him? People are going to ask you, why do you live a certain way? Why are there certain things you don't do? You know, I notice this about your life. You know, it's important that we live a good life. We're doing the right things. It's important to know the story about God's position on the story. God has a position on, on sin. So it's important to understand some things about Scripture and, and God's God's story. God says, you know, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. See, there, there has to be some bad news in order to, for there to be good news. But there is a sin problem. You and I both have a sin problem. And the only way that we can experience redemption is through God's grace, his gift to us. For by grace we've been saved through faith. Not of our own doing, but through the gift of God. You know, there's different scriptures we can point to and use. But I think if we make it personal, 
the more that we can help people understand that it's not just some scripture we're pointing to them, but out of real understanding that this is what God has done for me. No one is righteous. Not, there's not one of us that's righteous enough. But through God's plan of grace, we can be saved. So understanding your story, how, does God, how has God helped you? And the other thing is this. We have a culture here at Winchester Nazarene. We want you to invite people. We want you to invite people to church. Why? Because we, if you're too scared or you're, you're not sure how to explain the gospel message, we want this to be an opportunity for you to bring your friends here to church where they might hear the gospel message. We want them to hear the good news of Jesus. We want them to be exposed to other Christians. Are we all perfect people? The answer is no. no. But through God, we are being transformed daily. And we're hopefully being transformed in a very positive direction. Being more, made more and more like Christ. I encourage you to invite people to our services. Because it's an opportunity for them to hear the message of Jesus. For them to hear the message that you can be changed from the inside out. You don't have to continue down the path you're in. We're, we're gearing up for Easter. and We've got that coming and it's really going to happen. Easter's coming in about 10 weeks from right now. I know it's crazy to think about it. it's, that, it's, that far, it's that close. But I want to encourage you to invite one or two people just just make an effort for one or two people that you're going to say, I'm going to make a huge effort to invite at least one or two people. Maybe you say, you know what, Pastor, that's not enough. I need two or three. I, need to, I want to step it up. Whatever God is asking you to do, would you step up your invitation? Inviting people to our services. Inviting people to youth group, teenagers. Inviting them to things that, they, that you can have them get exposed to the church. I can tell you that it takes a long time for people to hear the message week in and week out before they finally come to a place where they're ready to accept that gospel message. You know, we've experienced in our own church, we had people that came for months upon months. Until finally that one day when, when the Holy Spirit broke through. And their response to that, that, that call the Holy Spirit to come, give your heart to Jesus, come, experience my salvation. They said yes. We've had people experience it at the altars. We've had people experience it in Sunday school classes, on the side of the road. Wherever God wants to make that moment in time happen, where the good news becomes great news in our lives. When we're changed from the inside out, it does change us. It makes us the kind of person that God wants us to be. And we begin to experience the greatness of God. The grace of God in a way that we've never experienced it. For those of us who have experienced God's grace and provision and salvation, man, we have a great story to tell. So I want you to think about your story. What is your story? How has God changed you from the inside out? I can tell you that one of the reasons that churches are dying It's not because they don't have a great building. It's because they have forgotten that we are called to share the gospel message. We are called to share the gospel message. We've lost, many churches that are dying have lost their passion for lost people. We were all lost at one point until Jesus found us. Or we finally said, I want that Jesus. I want us to be a church that is a place of grace where those who maybe say, you know what, I don't know if I can step foot in that church. You know, I'm so bad the, the, the ceiling's going to fall down. Some of you walked in this building, the ceiling's still standing. I want us to be a place of grace. Why? Because Jesus is a place of grace. And if the church is the bride of Christ, we need to reflect him. I want us to embrace those who walk through our doors, regardless of their past, regardless of what, what's going on in their life. 
with the hope and the, and the prayer that God is going to take them from where they are to where he wants them to be. God can transform any type of person from any kind of sin. But we have to believe that. If he can change you, he can change that other person just as much. The reality says the people need Jesus. People need Jesus. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. How badly do we want people to know Jesus? That will change whether or not we have enough passion to really put this into, into gear. Now I'm dealing, dealing with these, kind of the preparation, the ready. Let's get ready. Thinking about your story. You know, have you, have you written out your story? Have you, have you talked through your story? Preparation means you're, you're practicing it. Tell your story to somebody. It doesn't have to be perfect the first time. But the more and more you share your story, the better it becomes. You know, the, uh, for, for some of you older, older uh, Christians, people who have been in the church a long time, I'm going to give you another word for story. You guys ready for it? Testimony. Okay? Don't we get, it, don't we, don't we get excited when, we, when somebody else shares their testimony of what God is doing? That's what story is. Are we sharing our testimony? Are we sharing what God is doing? The more we do that, the better we become. We get, we get invigorated. It helps us. It encourages us, right? If you come on Wednesday nights, we have a lot more of that interactive kind of testimony happening. Why? Because I know that you need to get through the week. I encourage you to come. Encourage you to bright friends. Why? Because it's a point where we connect with God. So what's the big deal to this? Being ready is the first step in allowing the Holy Spirit to use you to lead others to Jesus Christ. Being ready is the first step in allowing the Holy Spirit to use you to lead others to Jesus Christ. The only way we get prepared is by being ready. But being so ready that when the Spirit says, go, speak, we are already ready to go. You never know what God is going to ask of you. You never know where he's going to place you in terms of what he wants you to do in terms of sharing your story. But the more that we're ready, the more that we're going to be positioned to where God wants to, to put us and to use us. Being ready is the first step to allowing the Holy Spirit to use you to lead others to Christ. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus. You know what? I want you to know my Jesus. You know, I, I, I grew up in the church and maybe my story isn't that cool. But I can tell you this much. Even as a five-year-old kid, I thought I was a bad sinner. I thought I was terrible. Because, you know, I talk bad to my, back to my parents just like everybody, other, every other kid in the world, right? And I knew that God needed to save me. And it became more real as I got older. And I know I asked Jesus into my life several times as a kid. Not because it didn't take the first time, just because I felt like I needed to continue to ask Jesus to forgive me. And I still do that from time to time when I mess up. But Jesus wanted to come in and wanted to change me. And I know that if he can change me, he can change you. So how do you do that? I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you an ABC. A says, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. There's not one of us in this room that's not a sinner. We've all done wrong things. Every one of us. Here's what I know. Even, even if you're like, I'm a good person, we have all done wrong things. We all know it. We may not want anyone else to know about it, but we, we were aware of it. 
So acknowledge that we're a sinner. We're all sinners in here, so we're all in good company. B, believe that Jesus is the one who died for you. Believe that Jesus died for you. He didn't want you to go to hell. He wanted you to be in heaven with him. Believe in Jesus and see us confess your sins. In other words, we've got to tell God, here's my junk, here's my stuff. Would you forgive me for this? Some of us may have, like, notebooks full of stuff. Maybe when you're a five-year-old kid, you're, 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 it's a notepad, you know, just a few things. But the point is, we all have stuff that we need to share with God. But I know this much about God. He is faithful and just to forgive us. And he can cleanse you. In other words, he can make you clean again. He can make you righteous.